Ketib Yassin, the novelist in particular, has this line that we repeat all the time. He, an Algerian writer, author of Nejma, who uh, was challenged one time by an interviewer saying, but you're anti-colonial and, and yet you keep writing in French. And, and he replied that for, for us, French is a butin de guerre, a, a war bounty. And therefore, it's something that we can appropriate and we can enrich by our experiences. Welcome to the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today in the studio in Beirut, we we're very, very honored to have Idris Jabari, who is a historian and an academic and somebody who thinks about intellectual thought and um, intellectualism out of North Africa in sort of this post-colonial moment. It's a topic that I'm very interested in, but coupled with that interest is an enormous lack of knowledge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for your hospitality. Okay, I want to start with the most with a basic question that's really hard to answer, but maybe there's a um, a good way to start. Is it possible to decolonize our thinking? Fascinating question. Very large question. Yeah. Obviously, I think uh, the question of decolonization of our thinking uh, starts with the realization of the impact of colonialism and its lasting impact up to this day. Uh, yeah. And I personally began putting these two things together uh, back home in North Africa, thinking yeah. about very tangible everyday things such as language. Um, the first one that emerges the most is the way that in North Africa, French coexists with Arabic or Derija, the everyday Arabic in, in North Africa. Where does that come from? Yeah. And why does it persist many, many decades, 60 years after the end of colonialism? Um, and of course, language still being central to the conversation isn't simply about a, a tool for expression, but I believe it also shapes the way we think yeah. and our relationship to France, whose language we still speak. And having gone to French schools for a couple of years, I f saw that um, being very clear and manifest itself in terms of how we relate to our identity and, and our culture and how some questions are pre-answered. So yeah. decolonizing our thinking, I would perhaps challenge a little bit the question, not by saying, is it possible? But I think it's necessary because by starting this conversation around um, how we need to decolonize how we think, we can then open up different questions about who we are. Yeah. To go back more directly to your question, is it possible? I think that the tools are there and it's just about starting this conversation. And in doing so, building on how this conversation has been had periodically throughout our history, and I'm interested in the 60s in particular, in this moment right after independence, where these fascinating debates were taking place. And what drew me to that moment is uh, there was a sense of the possible, which is very different from how we today think about certain big questions as being settled and not really open to debate. Yeah. We are complex, we are multi-layered and, and multilingual, and we have complicated relationships to our, to our identity. But in the 60s and 70s, right after independence, this generation of thinkers were fearless about saying we need to address and perhaps let go of certain things that we've taken with us from the colonial period. Okay, so for somebody who's not familiar with the 20th century history of North Africa, Let's set the stage a little bit to understand the historical context for some of these thinkers. So um, let's start with the end of World War, uh, World War II yes. and maybe set the stage for us what was actually happening politically yes. and then how did uh, independence happen mm -hmm. and what role did these intellectuals play in that, in that process? So as um, most people know from far, France colonized North Africa, a different form of colonization in Algeria, which was a settlement colony from Morocco and Tunisia, which were uh, protectorates. And really, it was in the interwar years in the 1930s that you see this growth of nationalist ideas and mobilization interrupted by World War II, where the colonies had to contribute to the war effort. And then you can see uh, after liberation, 
really in the case of Algeria, the day after, the day of the armistice, these nationalist demands coming to the surface once more, the famous mm. uprisings of Sitif and Gelma on the 8th of May, uh, brutally repressed. And then you see at that point in time that the nationalist movements of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia have one thing on their mind, which is to achieve their independence. These are big nationalist parties that manage to uh, articulate the demand for independence, but also present a platform for what independence would look like. So there are a lot of writings on social justice, on education, on all these topics. The place of the woman is debated, and all of these questions are articulated by intellectuals. But they're a very specific breed of intellectuals. They're what uh, and what Abdel Malik would call these intellectual fighters. And so they're mobilizers, but they're also at the same time crafting these ideas. In Morocco, you have someone like Al Fasi, but also the next generation, Mehdi Ben Barka, who's more on the left side of the spectrum. And those people, of course, are idealists, but I've also always seen them as being quite uh, pragmatic yeah. as well in leading the fight. They're very active in newspapers, and they're able to, in the case of Morocco and Tunisia, um, push France to the negotiation table. In the case of Algeria, of course, they have to fight this eight-long uh, bloody war from 54 to 62. Yeah. Intellectuals played a role in it, but it's a little bit more complicated in the Algerian case. So, um, okay, that's helpful context. So let's let's take, like, mid-60s. Mm -hmm. um, there are these these thinkers and writers who are uh, advocating for people to 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 to, uh, to um, use a hip hop reference to free your mind, yeah. right? Basically, that's yeah. the idea. So we've gained independence. Mm -hmm. We need to get independent. We need to think independently. Mm -hmm. We need to decolonize the way we think, the way we behave with each other, in in many different ways. Did these people? And maybe you can mention who some of these uh, figures are, but did these people see this as a, a horizon that they'll never be able to uh, to reach? Mm. And it was the act of thinking about this as a worthwhile um, a worthwhile endeavor, or did they think, no, no, we're going to get there. It's just step one, two, three. Just yeah. you know, follow the choreography, and we will get there. Sure. Yeah, I, I wish it was as simple as that. And you, you know so well that in the midst of historical transformation, there's rarely that clarity. And in fact, this realization of the need for the decolonization of the mind doesn't happen right after independence. That generation that fought so much to achieve independence in the late 50s and early 60s, what they're interested in is building the state and bringing about social and economic transformation and affirming that na national sovereignty. Those are not the ones that I consider to be uh, the drivers of the conversation for uh, intellectual decolonization. It's their successors. So you have those who come of age in the early 50s, and oftentimes they're mobilizing in the political party establishment and structure. They take over the state. But then their successors, who those I call the 1930s generation. These are bureaucrats. The first generation are basically bureaucrats. They end up oftentimes yeah. filling the, the ranks of the nascent uh, state administration. Yeah. And the 1960s, in the case of North Africa, is very interesting because there's so much change happening. And you'd think this is what the promise of independence was supposed to be about. If you open these uh, glossy government brochures that show you all the dams being built, all the, in Algeria in particular, the revolution of agriculture and education and, and industrialization, it seems as if independence delivered. And yet what is extremely striking in that history is in the late, from the mid to the late 60s, these three countries are beset by student protests in uh, Casablanca in 1965, in Tunis in 67, 68, and then periodically in Algeria as well. What does that mean when the young people for whom the country was being built are not joining or satisfied with how the country is progressing, hmm. along with other contradictions that start to emerge to the surface? And that's when the next generation of intellectuals, those who went through the passage from colonialism to independence and matured in these early years of independence, realize that they're extremely beholden to conceptions of progress that they had inherited from colonialism. Mm. 
So I look in particular at historians and sociologists who see very clearly that their predecessors, those who are now running the show and implementing these development programs, the, um, and I use, for example, the figure of Ahmed bin Saleh yeah. in Tunisia, who was this very young and very accomplished minister who starts accumulating all these portfolios to <laughs> such a point as he becomes known as the super minister for Habib Bourguiba. Hmm. But he is developing this program of rapid development and industrialization in the 60s in conversation with development experts in France, Gérard de Bernice, for example, who would go on also to have an important role in Algeria in promoting this policy we call industrializing industries. But at the same time, Ben Salah faces a lot of uh, opposition in the countryside for his collectivization policy. And so this generation of sociologists realize that they have to redefine what it means to be to move forward, to detach tradition from progress. And that work cannot happen, the work of developing Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, until they've worked very closely on these notions and that doesn't happen in a straightforward manner, but progressively and uh, in particular in this context of student agitation. Yeah. Wait, I want you to say that again. So they were trying to think through how to detach um, tradition from progress. Yes. What did they associate tradition with and what did they associate progress with? That's the fascinating bit. Uh, you, for, for, to understand that, we have to go back to the importance of the French Orientalist establishment, this okay. overall... Um, infrastructure of knowledge production. All of these scholars that began in the beginning of the colonial occupation coming with the army and settling these outposts that we call the Bureau Arab, the Arab offices, where you had a range of scholars who would start to observe realities on the ground. Everything from the fauna and the flora all the way to costumes and norms. And these people become extremely important in producing a sociology of North African society, and also influencing military decisions, political decisions on the ground. What I find uh, extremely telling and interesting is, number one, that these figures go on to remain very influential after independence. And there are some very notable examples, such as Charles-André Julien, this historian who was politically supportive of North Africa's independence. And he is put in charge of building the new independent university after independence in Morocco of Rabat. So there's a continuity of those figures across independence. And secondly, that these independent young North African scholars are learning about their societies oftentimes by reading the works left by these scholars who are produced in a very colonial context. Mm. And it's figures like Montaigne, for example, people who in the 1920s and 1930s were going to the countrysides and observing things and imbuing it with the colonial atmosphere of that time, which, for example, contains certain ideas that include uh, that North Africa was colonized because it was colonizable. This yeah. is a very important notion by Malik bin Nabi, the Algerian thinker. It was colonizable because it, Islam had gone through a period of decline, of civilizational decline, and to think that these disciplines contain such values and such big ideas was for them a problem when they were trying to modernize the country. Mm. Okay, so at the time, I, I said this to you right before we started uh, filming. Um, at the time, did some of these thinkers, um, did they have um, case studies that they were looking at? We need to decolonize the way we think um, and the way we behave as a society, like blank. Mm. Who is it? Even did they have a, a case study that this is this is possible? Yes, yeah, very good question. So, I think I can answer this in two ways. On yeah. the one hand, what I've witnessed the most is it's coming up organically. Mm. This is a response to very tangible problems that they're facing regarding how they can understand certain, certain social phenomena taking place outside of the goggles of progress and, and tradition backwardness. Yeah. And so the case studies in the first instance are very local, but also taking place at a Maghrebi level. 
So sociologists in Rabat are meeting with their Tunisian counterparts. And I've interviewed some of these figures who tell me that it was amazing for them to realize, oh, you're facing the same issue. How do you understand? I'll give you another example, the notion of the tribe. Is the tribe a form of social unit mm. that is meant to disappear? Or can it coexist with a modern nation state and its own notions of citizenship and other forms of solidarity? There are tribes in Morocco, there are tribes in Algeria, there are tribes in Tunisia. So these conversations happen organically due to issues that they, fee that they face. But once they're gaining in confidence and gaining that confidence to start challenging the Western sociological toolkit, that's when I see them connecting a lot more at the international level. And I've looked in particular at, say, international sociology gatherings and who's attending what are they talking about? And are North Africans and Arab scholars getting together in their provincialized panels? Or are they brought in with, say, scholars from Mexico and Argentina yeah. and West Africa, Senegal, or South Asia and India? And as we move forward in the 70s, that's where I'm finding a lot more traces of these North Africans reading, citing, but also dialoguing with the others. And I'll one example that yeah. I love in particular yeah, please is give me one. Uh, Moroccan sociologist Abd Kabir Khatibi, mostly known for his novels, but he was the head of the sociology department in Rabat. And he goes to Caracas in Venezuela in the early 1970s. And he comes and he gives an interview to this Moroccan magazine called La Malif, where he is equal parts excited, but also a little bit angry because he says in the interview to, to uh, Zekia Daoud, that he just came from there where there were something like hundreds of thousands of sociology students who were actively challenging Western notions, Western sociological notions. And he was in a way inspired, but also jealous that the Arab world didn't display that kind of intellectual uh, courage. So yes, I think the second part really, when this generation realizes that's what they need to do, they start branching and that's when I think we're in the context where faced with a case of um, global thought, yeah. a South-South dialogue. Okay. I want to sort of zoom to today and then we'll, we'll backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I feel like when, when people see this term of decolonize, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people think that it's a very... Um, it is a conversation for basically elite to have, yeah. right? It's happening in the hallways of the academy. It's happening um, with sort of like trust fund artists are spending mm -hmm. a lot of time thinking about this. Um, and it's not something that, d you know, people day to day, dentists and delivery people and yes. um, just normal, normal human beings in the region are thinking about. Mm. Um, was it always like that? Was it like, was that the, the, the tenor of the conversation back then? Or did it just at some point evolve into this, mm. to where it is now? Or is this completely in my imagination, which is <laughs> that's also possible? That's another very important question. And what this automatically make, makes me think about is, uh, first of all, how do we translate the word decolonization in Arabic? Okay. And I've often grappled with the difficulty of yeah. coming up with certain terms that are so central to our conversation in their equivalence yeah. with decolonization in, in Arabic. I've asked around, brainstormed on social media, and there isn't something that is one uh, harmonious, widely used, and also carries the same meaning. So does that mean that the act of decolonization doesn't happen, right? In right now, when we think about decolonization, and here I need to answer as a historian, there are two big schools of thought. Decolonization can refer to the journey from being colonized to be independent, as having your flag at the United Nations, mm -hmm. being recognized as a state. And then the other school of thought that believes that decolonization doesn't stop the day you become an independent nation. It's actually a work that continues, whether you're consciously doing it, putting that label on it, or doing it in a way that isn't as visible and yet as effective. It is as effective. 
Let's give you an example. Um, nationalizing the economy and being able to reclaim it from foreign interests is yeah. an act of decolonization. Is it always called decolonization? Not necessarily. So I would say that when we think about decolonization, there is a certain side of it, which, as you say, is very intellectual and reserved for some quarters who are able to pinpoint to that very specifically. But it is a larger process, which is diffusing society, which uh, is being carried out without really that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because what you're talking about are... Are, are like very hard and tangible things. Yes. Basically, is the sort of like, um, is the metropolis, mm. basically, do they have power over yes. daily life? Do they have power over resources? Mm. Do they have power over borders? Mm -hmm. Do they have power over political processes? Do they have power over laws? Um, which obviously without a colony, mm. um, on its face it looks like, oh, this doesn't exist. But if they're controlling, if they are controlling basically the political process through lobbies or through sure. um, a hundred year, a uh, hundred year mm -hmm. tenders of ports and stuff like that, <laughs> exactly. then um, then clearly. But it's not about language, right? It's not about thinking. No, it's yeah. about concrete examples. Yeah, yeah and yeah. the one concrete example, which I think is the most illustrative. Yeah. Well, that might be my own bias because I'm yeah, in yeah. the education sector, is when you look at the continuation of education ties between uh, countries in our region and their former colonial metropolis. Now, mm -hmm. in North Africa, we have very deep ties with France. Yeah. Uh, I've looked at the list of students in France, and uh, North African countries are in the top four, even before countries that are way more populous than we are, such as China and, and India. Um, I don't think the North Africans take the top three, but they're definitely up there. And why is it that we still continuously have our youth wanting to go and get a degree in engineering or literature or whatever in the University of Paris or Marseille, Lyon, and, and so on and so on? And that has to do with, uh, uh, that opens up a fascinating conversation around decolonization, but also the ties that do not end with the moment of independence. There are a plethora of universities in both uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, many of whom that, are, uh, that offer diplomas which are up there and very rigorous and great scholars leading them. So what is it about our need to remain connected? Now, that doesn't need to be uh, a negative, right? The extreme version of that is those who advocate for closing ourselves to the rest of the world and going into insularity. And, and that's not what I think, that's not what I believe in, and that's not what the generation of thinkers I'm interested in were themselves advocating for. Yeah. They were, for lack of a better word, forms of cosmopolitans who were themselves the product of multiple influences. They had studied in what we call these bilingual schools. They believed that the meeting place of Arab culture and French slash Western culture could generate fascinating insights. What they were saying, what I think is a more interesting conversation, is bringing these two cultures into a dialogue whereby the two of them are assured of themselves and we recognize the power that is at the heart of this interaction as a result of colonialism. Yeah. So it's not about not using the word Mina and starting to use the word Swana. That is not, <laughs> that's not what they're advocating for. Yes, that's, uh, I wonder, I would need to go back and see if they deployed the language of the Arab region. And of course, yeah. in North Africa, you have to consider that we are also, um, we're a country of, of Amazigh, of Berbers. And yeah. so we need to find ways to acknowledge that without sort of losing the conceptual value of such terms, but you realize that we could be here all day talking about words and notions and, yeah. and what they mean. I'm curious about, I want to talk about language because it's uh, a really important part of um, the conversation, particularly in North Africa with uh, Darijo, Amazigh, and all these different um, uh, sort of uh, languages and um, registers that, um, that are more or less indigenous, mm. depending on who, who you speak to. Um, but before I get to that, I'd like to talk about Latin America, because you were talking about Caracas. Yes. So 
these thinkers who were looking at different parts of the world, yes. were they looking at Latin America and thinking to themselves, how are they even going to possibly decolonize themselves if they can't speak anything but Spanish? Yes. And why is it that French or English or any other colonial language is such a, a problem? Yes. That's where I want to push back because okay. I think we've reached a certain point where we have fetishized, fetishized language to a point where we forget how that generation, and I'm thinking of Katib Yassin, the novelist in particular, has this line that we repeat all the time. He, an Algerian writer, author of Nejma, who uh, was challenged one time by an interviewer saying, but you're anti-colonial and, and yet you keep writing in French. And, and he replied that for, for us, French is a butin de guerre, a, a war bounty. And therefore it's something that we can appropriate and we can enrich by our experiences so that we're not beholden to the ideas that uh, have been deployed in order to assert our domination over our thinking. And I think that's, I would believe, a good example to illustrate the power of being able to subvert these power relationships that exist within language. To go back to your question about Latin America, what I've seen is an admiration on the part of my intellectuals over what is being carried out, meaning language is used as a way to access different traditions, different dialogues, different debates, but ultimately the goal is to carry out this work on the ground. And on the other side as well, Spanish being colonial language is nonetheless the vehicle to create an anti-colonial or anti-globalizing uh, cultural and intellectual ecosystem on the ground. Yeah. And my um, the people I study admire the amount of work coming out. And I'm particularly seeing, for example, Walter Mignolo and his writings on epistemic disobedience as being a driver of what these thinkers want to emulate. Now, I don't have concrete evidence that the North Africans I'm interested in are reading the Latin Americanists sure. in the original language, but I do have citations that show that they're aware and they're admiring. There are also references to uh, more anti-colonial and guerrilla movements as well, such as the Che and Cuba and so on, and all that shows the sideways glances that these scholars are, are having with each other. Okay, let's let's um, introduce me and our audience to some of these figures. So um, I'm just going to ask you to say some of their names and who they are and yes. um, what maybe some of their seminal works are, so that people can actually like look these people up. <laughs> so I began, uh, if I can start this way rather than uh, the order. Yeah. I began uh, my doctoral work by looking at Abdullah Larwi, the Moroccan historian, and Hisham Jayet, the Tunisian historian. Um, in 1974, both of them publish these critical essays. Uh, Larwi publishes uh, La Crise des Intellectuels, The Crisis of Arab Intellectuals, Historicism and Traditionalism. And on the other side, Jayid publishes The Arab Islamic Personality. And it was very striking that these two extremely powerful essays come out the same year. And you have to understand that within the historical context of the Arab world, 1967, and this remarkable moment of intellectual renewal that takes place here in Beirut, but across the Arab world. And from there on, those two books made me realize that there was a larger story taking place. And around them, I started to reconstitute connections, influences, to do that, having to go back to the ground and not simply focus on two books published by prestigious publishers in Paris, but also their connections closer to home. So when you look at um, uh, this, what uh, Sharabi has referred to in one of his seminal articles in 1988 as the Maghribi school of cultural critics, mm -hmm. you have figures such as Muhammad Abd al-Jabri, the philosopher of Turath, who uh, came from tr the tradition of the political left in Morocco and writes throughout the 1980s this large work inviting um, scholars to revisit Arab heritage from a critical lens. On the sociological front, Abd Kabir Khatabi is another seminal figure in this moment who began as a sociologist, very active in the space of periodicals, and then turning to novels and literary and poetic works in order to capture a sort of alternative understanding of culture. Algeria has a number of 
intellectuals who exist within the landscape of the state and the FLN party, the National Liberation Front, uh, people like Ahmed Talbi Ibrahimi or Malik Ben Nabi or Mustafa Lasharraf, who represent perhaps what I began by talking about, this nationalist conscience trying to decolonize in very uh, superficial or practical ways, such as Arabizing education. And they're struggling to really get at the depth of these colonial notions. Malik Ben Nabi, not so much, but the others, uh, Mohammed Harbi, they're very close to the state. In Tunisia, I've uh, been fascinated by those who exist within or around the university. Mm. People like uh, Abdel Qadir Zghal or Lilia Ben Salem or Abdouhab Bouhdiba, who are all these sociologists trained in French universities, trying to understand Tunisian society, and then at one point realizing we can't continue deploying the tools of French sociological analysis. We need to pay attention to culture, poems, and other forms like that. But the one that uh, really, I think, represents the culmination of this process of intellectual decolonization is Fatima Mernissi, the yeah. sociologist who comes back from the United States in 1973, 1974, and she arrives in Rabat in this fulcrum of conversations around decolonization. And she arrives in Rabat, a city that bears the marks of colonialism. It's still uh, separated between neighborhoods that were designed to be separate or separated on the basis of which nationality lives there. Mm. This is the work of Abu Lourouj. She titled it Rabat, um, urban, a case of urban apartheid. A very strong word to wow. describe a city after independence. The difference being that after independence, it wasn't divided by nationality and race, but by social class. So the Spanish who used to live in L'Océan have now left and they're replaced by the working classes. So this idea, sorry if I go on a tangent no, 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 about I, I, this just book. Real quick, I just want to clarify this. So the nationalities that uh, were being separated are the Spanish, the French, and the Moroccans? In the colonial period. Yeah, okay. And then after independence, with this, most of the settlers leaving, the neighborhoods remain these insular pockets in the city. And because they, they were designed that way. Exactly. Yeah. And now the middle classes move to Agdel, which used to be the French administrative quarters, and so on and so on. And that's, for her, an illustration of Moroccan society in, in the 1970s. Yeah. And here comes Fatima Marnisi, who witnesses these lines being very rigid, and her peers, other sociologists, kind of accepting to work within those parameters. And what I absolutely admire about her and seek to highlight is that she decides to start hopping between neighborhoods. And she's able to because she speaks Arabic and French and English. She masters the language of everyday life, but also of scientific production. And she simply has this rebellious side in her as a product of independence, somebody who still believed very strongly in those ideals and is not accepting to be cowered by these realities. Yeah, And then the works that I uh, think embody that the most is how she decides not to study modernization and its impact on the middle class woman, but she focuses on the urban maid as a mobile actor who is often left in the margins mm. and represents to her a lot more what modernization or its shortcomings are about. So. Fatima Mernissi. Let's let's talk about Fatima Mernissi a little more. Um, was she a was she a figure who was in the public eye at the time? <laughs> she would be a lot more later on. But if you're talking about the 1970s, there are a lot of traces of her in these periodicals, such as La Malif, El Assas, and so on and so on. And she writes about her sociological work at the point at that point in time in Rabat in particular the periodical was sort of the chief currency, how these intellectuals conversed with each other. And so I found a lot of traces of her writing about topics of interest. But then what I also was quite amazed to find in the archive is she would also write about other topics. There's one in particular where she goes to a party on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And uh, she describes in minute detail everything from how she nearly slept on, uh, slipped on a carpet, how she found the cushions uncomfortable, but all of that serves to highlight certain very 
crucial social features in society. And she talks in that article about the, the intellectual terrorist, this man who comes and asks her about her evening and then starts rubbishing her opinions or what we call today mansplaining mm -hmm. things that she is a scholar on and then at that point dissecting uh, key aspects of gender relations and social relations in Rabat. So in that way, she is in the public eye, but once she starts writing the books that uh, she's most famous for, yeah. then she becomes a lot more in the public eye in a more <laughs> negative way. And uh, there are horrible stories of uh, Islamist students coming to her classes and shouting her down and threats uh, to, to her and to, to her work. And she, uh, as far as I understand, was then pushed out of teaching and put in a research structure. And, and then she becomes a lot more in, in, her, uh, in the public eye. And there's a movie that was just released about her recently. Yeah. That period. I like how her uh, periodicals basically sound like her Twitter feed. <laughs> That's a great parallel. <laughs> <laughs> That's because she pioneered the Twitter feed, yes. the intellectual uh, Twitter feed. Which makes you wonder, in 20, 30 years, will there be historians peeling through somebody's Twitter feeds and telling histories about I think it? there will be. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to come back to this idea of the housemaid. I think that's the term used. Yes. Um, so first of all, who are these people? Like, uh, give us a sense of... Who are these um, individuals? Where are they coming from? Mm. Uh, what were their lives like? Mm. Why, why did she think it was a reflection of, um, or, or like a, uh, a, I guess a reflection of modernity and it's um, the trappings that come along with it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I focus on the case of Morocco, but this is something that can easily be broadened sure. to the three countries of North Africa and perhaps across the Arab world. And she starts with this puzzling observation that the national uh, development strategies was for men and women, co-ed couples, to both be in the public sphere, working in offices. That's the utopic future in the Arab world in the 60s and the 70s. But for that to take place, there needs to be an answer to the question of domestic labor. And that answer is oftentimes addressed very painfully and unfairly by uh, unfair distributions of labor towards women. But in the case that she observes, that these ideal families have in the background a domestic worker who is doing all of the rest of the work. Um, to understand who these people are, we need to replace her own biography in, in the center of the conversation. She starts carrying out these missions for international organizations the same way that the World Bank or the UN would now commission an academic to carry out a study. So there's a region in Morocco called the Gharb where she went and she uh, studied the effect of mechanization, but also uh, demographic change and mobility from the countryside to the cities. So uh, as, as everyone knows, when machines are introduced, that reduces the amount of work there is in farms. And Morocco, being this mostly rural uh, country, led to a lot of movement from the countryside to the cities. And so you start seeing, even from an urban point of view, the city grows. It doesn't grow with neighborhood, but it grows with shanty towns. And it mm. grows with these very shabby neighborhoods where uh, this excess of labor leads to the availability of young women, most of the time, being able to work in homes as cleaners, as uh, child uh, bear minders, as, as cooks, and so on and so on. Um, in the informal market, obviously, and with various levels of good or bad treatment. And so these are, to answer your question, usually women who come from the countryside, younger, before they get married, usually in their late teens or early 20s. And in her case, she uh, focuses the first big studies on this woman called Zohor. And I absolutely love that article. Uh, and it's been mm. translated a couple of years ago because what Fatima Barnisi does is not to look at this phenomenon from the top, this sort of dry economic perspective of just giving statistics and so on, but to humanize the character herself, to show that Zohor is not a product. She is in a way, but she also is an agent. Mm -hmm. And she has dreams and aspirations and desires to change her condition and makes a series of choices. So there's a passage in that interview with Zohor 
who lives in Saleh, if you know the geography of Rabat, uh, the city is here, there's a river in between, and on the other side there's another small city called Saleh, and the two of them are sort of existing uh, in tandem. Um, so Zohor lives in Saleh, crosses over to Rabat every day, and then works with this family. And she has a family that she feeds and helps with her income, along with her father and her mother, and she has many siblings. But Zohor also has a life on the weekend. She, mm. she and her friend uh, dress up, they go to the cinema, they go to the beach. She's very poetic about the quietness and the blue of the sea and how she has male suitors and how she sort of hides her condition by pretending that she's a seamstress. And, but her friend is a seamstress who hides her condition by pretending she's a secretary and a typist. And how Zohor at the end of the day doesn't like to hang out with people who are illiterate like she is, as she says in her words. She finds it more comfortable to spend time with those she calls intellectuals who make her think, make her reflect. Yeah. Now, why does this matter ultimately? Because at the heart of the national project and the promise made by these nationalist movements was that colonialism put North Africans in an inferior position. And the way to overcome that position under colonialism was through education. That gave you better jobs, but also even more rights. And these nationalist leaders, like Al Fasi in Morocco, promised the country that there would be schools for everybody and social elevation for all. Mm. And the fact that Fatima Marnisi, who was a product of these reforms, is able to highlight 20, 30 years later the continuation of oppression of these invisible figures, for her is an indictment of the national project and promises as a whole, and the need to have a conversation around how do we leave such figures in the margins. Yeah. Is this conversation still happening right now? And if it is still happening, which I, I know it is, but uh, if it is still happening right now, what do you think those thinkers would have, um, mm. would, uh, would think about what's happening? Mm. The, the status of this, this uh, sort of meditation and this debate or mm. um, this conversation? It's a good question. I think um, I'm always struck by the questions that they raise, the observations they make about society, uh, the economy, are essential to better understand the nature of the dynamics that shape North African societies. Um, so in that sense, I think they would observe many of the same features and carry out very critical work in, a, in order to be able to connect things and to be able to project themselves and envisage alternatives and simply have the kind of uh, political desire to mm. intervene into these conversations. How would they enter into the field of conversation today is a more difficult question because I don't believe it's about the individual, but as at least as much about the circumstances and the arena where you can have this conversation yeah. than about the person. So I don't believe that uh, geniuses appear at a certain point in time. Yeah. I think that th the terrain can be fertile. And most importantly, intellectual historians don't always give as much attention to the audience and the structures where these debates can take place as much as the brilliance and the conceptual value of certain ideas. So. I oftentimes read extremely poignant analyses made by friends or people I don't know on social media, but they don't have, let's say, an afterlife or a sort of staying power, the same way that the audience in the 60s and 70s onwards was crucial in order for these debates to shape the public conversations. Mm. Um, so that's how I would, would answer it, saying that a lot of these intellectuals who are still alive or who have passed recently have not been very active on the public front. And I'm thinking of Fatima Marnisi, yeah. uh, up until she passed away in 2014 or 15, was active in pockets of civil society. And, and I hope I'm not mistaken here, but did not have the same kind of visibility, even though she was extremely uh, insightful on, there was one question in particular I saw her intervene in, the question of youth and the question of violence amongst youth. She wrote this, she, co she coordinated a collective on uh, this movement of Charmil, for example, mm. which is uh, about 
youth gangs and violence. Yeah. And she participated in some meetings with intellectuals of the day, but not in the way that I've seen in the 70s and 80s. The conclusions I draw is it's less about the person and more about the moment, the audience and the possibilities, the infrastructure opened to be able to have those conversations. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about a paper that you delivered here at the Orient Institute um, a few days ago. Um, and you used to live in Beirut. You were a postdoc here at AUB and um, have spent a lot of time here. And part of the research, as I understand, from that period in your life was looking at the exchange of those intellects, uh, intellectuals in North Africa and, uh, and Lebanon, mm -hmm. basically a community in Beirut. And it, it got me thinking, um, how much did uh, their thinking um, about uh, decolonization change over the course of the 20th century um, after 1967, um, after... Um, uh, the Gulf War, um, after all these sort of aggressions yes. um, from uh, Western colonial powers, basically. Mm -hmm. So the impact of um, these big political events on, on their thinking. Yeah. So I, I would talk about two things yeah, here. Please. On the one hand, you have the dialogue taking place between North Africa and Arab audiences as a whole, as mediated by a sort of hub in Beirut, and that's the conference that we were just yeah. here to talk about. And that, for me, was a fascinating opportunity to think about the Arab field of ideas as a whole, right? If, uh, what defines the Arab field of ideas? You could say on the most basic level that it's produced by Arabs, and what characterizes Arabs is their uh, language of use. But these are, these are questions that need to be complexified tenfold at least before we start the conversation and it's in that that space of nuance that I was able to understand are North Africans and Arab audiences as a whole really dialoguing I find North Africans participating in journals here in events here being read being cited but dialogue itself is an intercultural practice yeah. that derives fundamentally on the nature of your historical experience so what I've tried to recreate in the first part of our, of our chat is what are these intellectuals thinking about on the ground? Yeah. They're thinking a lot about how colonialism is still present on their mind and how they're trying to liberate themselves from certain notions of progress and how they're trying to build these societies. And they arrive here either in person or through their ideas. They read what's being produced. And maybe we've not spent a lot more time thinking about the dislocation or the differences of concerns that exist. And um, that's where the conversation happens, and it can be generative, but it also can have some kind of um, closed avenues and uh, unfruitful participation. Typically, the geopolitics of North Africa are somewhat different from the geopolitics that you're experiencing here in the quote-unquote center of the Arab world. Yeah. Imperialism is experienced quite differently, but there are things that connect them quite well. And that is addressed on a case-to-case -case basis. The second part has to do with history and how it shapes their thinking. Now, I've really noticed the rupture taking place in the early 1990s from what came before. Yeah. The rupture was already taking hold, but let's say from throughout the 1980s with the end of the Cold War, there's a letting go of the possibilities of utopic change and then a sort of working towards more incremental reform. Uh, where do I see it in terms of the types of analyses and periodicals? Tell me exactly, uh, make that link. Okay, so uh, basically the Soviet Union mm. falls. Yes. Um, America emerges as this dominant mono superpower. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, that has all this these implications for... Um, flows of capital and flows mm -hmm. of money and flows of humans. Yeah. Um, why does that actually change? Why is that the straw yeah. that breaks the um, the camel's back, so to speak, on the, whether this utopic change could happen? Yeah, I wonder to which extent that's the straw or it's that classical uh, warning that correlation doesn't mean causation, that yeah, maybe yeah. there's something else that took place and this is just the event that points our attention to that moment. Okay. I do think that 
those who were advocating for intellectual decolonization and radical change in society were more aligned on the left. Yeah. And they're people who witnessed sort of the possibilities of change and the sheer scale of change. I mean, we have to keep in mind how much from a day to day basis and tangible, uh, how much the country was changing, the roads and the, the buildings and yeah. and the demographics and so on. And so maybe 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union was just the realization that we've entered a different phase of history. I tend to believe it's multifactorial. It's the fact that those people I wrote on were in their 30s in the beginning yeah. of my study. And then when you reach the 1990s, they've grown in age. And as part of the humanizing these, these figures, you're not the same kind of utopian help, hopeful figure later on when you have kids and children than you were before. Yeah. It's maybe the fact that these states that were very plastic in the early 60s have now become established year after year, decade after decade. And the 1990s is just the coming together of a multi multitude of different sources of influence. And uh, you can bring in other factors as well. Yeah. It's interesting because I wonder if um, if we take a look at the, the leading thinkers um, who are who are analyzing and crafting the way people think about society now mm -hmm. coming out of North Africa. Um, are they also, are, first of all, the question is, are they disciples of these people? <laughs> yeah. um, two, are they also all over the, the political map? Yeah. Um, and three, are they particularly interested in the Arab world? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, three, three things there. So. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, the, the Arab Spring and uh, all that, those conversations that were being held, uh, two yeah. of my colleagues, Fadma Aitmus and Risk Sikas, released a small book that won a lot of prize in Morocco called Dialogue with 15 Thinkers. And they sat down with them, and it's, it's a really great book. Amazing. And they presented the book a few times, and one of the elements they insisted, I think it was an recreated dialogue between two ordinary Moroccans over intellectuals. And if you will, they uh, take on the role of the cynic and the other character plays on the role of somebody who looks up to these intellectuals. And one of them says, why should we even care what they have to say? And the other one invites the first speaker not to think as intellectuals as prophets or preachers who tell us what to think, but as intellectuals who offer a grid to read what is happening and to decipher. And I've always found that exchange from uh, Fadma and Dries to be extremely generative in terms of the different rapport that intellectuals have hoped to establish with society, not to give us, to spoon feed the readers what they have to think, but to just be there like the training wheels in the beginning with the bike and then at one point they just push everybody to have more enlightened conversations. Now, where do you find these leaders of opinion? In the editorial page of newspapers with high circulation, on social media, I'm thinking of my friend Turabi, who has Hasan Turabi, who has this uh, very successful program on a TV channel in Dozem in Morocco, but in Tunisia, the talk shows, that's a form of intellectualism that is followed by the public. And if you look closely at what they publish on, Yes, they reflect on Moroccan society. They talk about language, inequality. COVID was a space of conversation as well. But they're also reflecting on other developments in the world. And I think um, ultimately, as part of, to go back to the original theme of intellectual decolonization and the legacy of this historical episode that I'm so interested in, it's the success of that was not to free our intellectual dependency on notions that were coming from the outside. Mm. If that was the standard, then that failed, for sure. But I think, and this is me uh, speculating or perhaps looking forward and presenting my interpretation, the success rate would come if their intervention in the public sphere led to the creation of an audience of people who are connecting things, expressing their opinions, challenging various forms of status quo. Is that the plural of status quo? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, from there on, 
going on to lead other conversations that would come. It's more about the process rather than yeah. the answers that need to be figured out and then we move to the next uh, stage of our existence. Okay, I'm going to end with asking you for some book recommendations. Yeah. Or, I guess uh, books, movies, films, any anything that you think people should check out um, that is related to your work. So mm -hmm. if you're put, putting together a, um, a gift registry, so to speak, um, related to North Africa, to decolonization, all that stuff. Let me put you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> I think if we were to put together uh, a collection of the critical essays that have inspired my work. Each chapter would have a couple of them, and it would be a, uh, a collection of, let's say, Fatima Marnisi's uh, On the Veil, 1975. It, there would have obviously be Hisham Jayat and uh, Larwi's 1974 essays. And I could go on and give you sort of 10 or 15 books from that time that are always striking to me for how, uh, how actual and, and current and direct their language is. What was always striking is simply the style of language that is very different from uh, what I would tend to read today. So that would be one way to potentially make somebody very happy with this pile of book. Yeah. But another way, and this has to do with the overall methodology and how I got into all of this, yeah. in uh, all of these cities in North Africa, in Rabat, Casablanca, Algiers, Wuhan, Tunis, and so on, in the old town you always have a secondhand bookseller. Sure. And there's a picture of one that was doing the round on Instagram. And he was, I'm sure you've seen this picture, he's sitting on the ground and he's surrounded by a pile of books through a frame. Yeah. And he's, this one is in downtown Rabat, but there are so many of them. And instead of curating these books, what I suggest to anybody I speak to is to enter one of these bookstores, spend an hour there, spend a bit of money there and come out with whatever you come out with. Yeah. And that is guided by your curiosities rather than me directing uh, more specifically towards specific. You're groups. speaking my language. This is the whole <laughs> mission of Africa as an organization. Very, very cool. Um, and thanks so much. This was very helpful. Um, it opened a it opened a whole area of um, of conversations that we don't typically have. So I'm really, really excited that you're on and you're able to share this stuff with us. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for the invitation and yeah. uh, continue with this great podcast. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you.